if you want to understand what people get motivated by, throw that question out. And so the question is, to be clear, who's, who are some business leaders that you look up to can be anybody. And then what is it about those business leaders that got them on that list and look for the patterns in the answers that people have. And then I'll tell you a lot about them and what they're looking for. And it'll give you as a leader, some good fodder for how to model yourself. Well, Rob, welcome to Empathy Let. Uh, I will give you the opportunity to introduce yourself. But before we start, I want to give a little bit of context uh, to the people that may be first time listener of, of our podcast. Uh, so Empathy Led is a show that is brought to you by the Grio Agency, a brand consultancy here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and our goal with this podcast is to help people become more empathetic leaders and to help them build empathetic organizations and brands. And our idea behind the podcast is to bring on experts on the subject, people that really flex and deploy empathy uh, in their respective jobs for us to learn from them just what it takes uh, to become a more empathetic leader and to build a more empathetic organization. So our idea is that this is, uh, we can learn all the lessons about empathy and, and bring these lessons with us into the business world. So without further ado, Please tell the good people who you are. <laughs> hi, Junior. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and hi, everybody. I'm Rob Volpe. I'm the CEO and founder of Ignite360. Uh, we're an insights and strategy and training firm. Um, we do marketing research with a lot of different companies, helping our clients connect with their consumers and understanding who they are, how they think and feel. Um, I'm also known as an empathy activist and wrote a book that came out earlier this year called, I'll pull it up, tell me more about that, uh, Solving the Empathy Crisis, One Conversation at a Time. And it is all about the, what we call the five steps to empathy. And those are the things that you need in order to be more empathetic in your, your engagements. Um, and uh, the last thing I'll say about the book, and then we can actually start a conversation <clears throat> around empathy, um, I use my own stories and my own experiences to bring to life um, my misadventures, if you would, and understanding of empathy. So times that it, doing research, you're constantly meeting people that are different from you. And that can be very challenging. And there were a lot of times that I was challenged. And so I share a lot of my own personal stories from throughout my life uh, about empathy and, and how I either failed or um, hopefully overcame some challenges and, and got to a place of empathy, all kind of framed up around the five steps themselves. So perfect. Yeah. I mean, the, the book, the book is absolutely fantastic, Rob. I think I, I really wanted to start there by congratulating you on, on a fantastic book. I think not only you were able to give us a real, make a real case for why we need to deploy a lot more empathy in our respective lives and our respective professions. But I think what I really loved about the book is just how practical it is. You know, when I talk about empathy with business leaders, it, at times it seems to lack practicality. And I think what you really did is to give us some actionable, practical steps and a framework that we can employ every time we feel that uh, a situation really demands empathy. So it's a beautiful read, beautiful written uh, and I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. I'm glad it it resonated with you that way. That's exactly how I intended it. I'm um, I we need you know, empathy, especially, is so kind of ethereal and, and misunderstood and tied to emotion, and and people don't always understand exactly what it is. Um, so I wanted to set out and give people very practical advice on how to um actually be more empathetic and what that actually looks like like what are those things you have to think about because it's it's one thing to say oh you need to be more empathetic leader or oh you need to have more empathy in your marketing but what what what, what does that mean what do i do how do i do it and that moment of truth is coming in the moment of that interaction that you're having with somebody and if you're not <clears throat> if you don't have the awareness 
of what you have to do. How are you possibly going to do that? You know, it's like, oh, here, go perform brain surgery. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but just cut the person open and have at it. Well, that's not going to work. And and empathy is the same same way, like any anything that we do. Yeah. No, no, no. I couldn't agree more. And, and I have to say, though, that reading the book made me um, a little bit more nervous about, about this conversation for, for two reasons, right? One, I am interviewing an expert on the subject, on a subject that I do talk about a lot, but I'm nowhere near the kind of expert that you are in the, in the subject. But two, I'm interviewing somebody who interviews people for a living. Right? So I just felt... I would be so subconscious throughout our entire conversation on some faux pas about how to run an interview successfully. Well, you're you're doing a great job, and we um, we are all works in progress. I, I as I'd say in the very beginning of the book, I wasn't born an empathy guru. I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and learning and, and reading what's out there and. And you're doing a great job. And as I talk about in the book, and it's why it's the title of the book, if you get stuck on, oh, what do I ask next? Just say, oh, tell me more about that. Tell me more about, and then whatever the, the topic was that somebody said. And it's a good way to get people to open up because honestly, and 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 this is really applicable for anybody in any conversation that they're having, the real kind of truth isn't in the first answer somebody gives. It's the, well, tell me more. It's that second layer. It's that peeling of the onion to get a little deeper into how somebody's thinking or feeling. And so it's a handy, uh, handy tip to keep in your back pocket. All right. I remember that. So how did you, why empathy? How did you arrive at this, at this specific place? Oh gosh, I, why not empathy? I mean, it really, you know, I, I, and I, I go into the, and tell stories about it in the book. But growing up um, in Indiana, I was othered by my classmates, and that was really painful. And empathy was the thing that ended up kind of activating within me as a superpower and helped me survive and, and get along. So from the time that I was 10, 12 years old, empathy has always just been part and parcel of, of what I do and how I move through the world. Um, but as a professional and as an adult, it, it, you know, in the work that we do, if you think about marketing and you're trying to influence, you know, ultimately marketing is about influencing human behavior, getting somebody to buy a product, a service or whatever. Um, it is that you're selling. Well, in order to do that, you've got to understand what their needs are and how they're thinking and feeling so that you understand what sort of a message you can present, uh, how to create a better product or service that's going to meet their needs and be something that uh, the marketplace actually wants, that consumers actually want. And the way that you do that, that, that is effectively understanding somebody else's point of view. That is having cognitive empathy with someone. So it, it to me, was kind of, you know, it was obvious that like, oh, well, this is a great fit for me. I'm empathetic and it's all about marketing and I understand people and how they think and feel. What we found though, as when I launched Ignite 360 12 years ago, we would do these uh, engagements, whether it was in-home interviews or we were doing focus groups or some other qualitative research and the clients wouldn't necessarily really get what the consumer was saying they were things were getting in their way from hearing what the consumer was saying from having empathy with their consumer and it was like it was frustrating because a the clients are spending a lot of money with us we were taking a lot of our own time and putting a lot of effort into it <clears throat> and there was just this disconnect that would occasionally happen and so we started to take a look at what was going on, and that's where we identified what the five steps were um, from the barriers that were coming with our clients and, and some other things. But ultimately, it's like if we can get the clients over that hump where they can then actually have that empathetic connection with their consumer, they're going to do a lot better. And and some of our greatest successes um, and that are you know, as I think of our greatest successes, things that our clients have taken and gone on and created great marketing campaigns, great products. Um, it's because we got them to connect and understand the consumer and have empathy with them. And we were able to, to achieve that. That was very powerful. It, it, <laughs> hearing you, it, for me, 
it becomes clear in in the way you just put it. I I always had this assumption that really the main obstacle was the fact that companies were not deploying enough empathy to try to understand their customers or their employees, which is one part of it. But what I heard you say also is that even when they are trying to listen more and, and ask customers, there are still obstacles that prevent them from, from really getting what the customers or whoever it is that they, what are some of those obstacles that even when we are trying to deploy more empathy and flex our empathy muscle, get in the way of us achieving that? Yeah, well, I think the biggest challenge for people to realize is that very often the a company's customer is not the same person psychographically, demographically as the employees that work at the organization. And so... You know, if you think about from a small startup all the way through to a large multinational and a small startup, the founder is usually involved and they've typically created the the product or whatever the offering is because they've recognized a need in the market. They actually have empathy with the consumer. They've seen an opportunity and they hopefully have been able to pass that vision on to their core initial employees. But then as a company gets a bit bigger, say it's got 20, 25 employees or larger, there starts to be too many people and they don't have, they, they aren't connected to that vision of the founder. And then you continue to scale it up to larger companies, mid-sized companies, big companies. And <clears throat> there is no understanding, you know, innately. And, you know, if you, I think about some of our clients, you know, that are really large, well-known brands everybody's got an advanced degree. Um, they're all living, you know, maybe in the suburbs, maybe in an urban environment. Um, you know, they're not necessarily reflective of who their consumer is. So first and foremost, people have to embrace the fact that I am not my consumer. And, and if you understand that, then that's the first step in, in kind of opening yourself up to having those experiences. Um, and then when you're in those experiences, the biggest thing that we see that gets in the way of, you know, more educated individuals tends to be judgment. And so dismantling judgment is the first step uh, to empathy. And judgment is something that just keeps coming up um, throughout all the steps. But in particular, it is just a brick wall. Um, and so this isn't about making a judgment. Making a judgment is decision making. This is about being judgmental. This is casting aspersion, saying, saying and thinking negative thoughts towards or, or expressions towards somebody be, just because they're other, because you don't understand them. And it it takes on the the forms of hatred, obviously, but there's also sort of I don't want to call it a microaggression necessarily, because it's not that. It's just a bias. That people will have and thinking, oh well, I understand them, and and you know, it's the othering that can start to happen. And so you've got to be aware of that, and you've got to dismantle it. And and really, the only I wish there was some magic trick, um, and, and maybe it is a magic trick. You just have to have awareness that you're doing it, and stop yourself in that moment when you're about to have that thought and go, wait, why am I thinking that? Why do I want that to, you know, and, and how is that clouding how I'm, I'm thinking? Maybe I should just step back and be open and have unconditional positive regard for this other individual and hear what they have to say. So dismant yeah, dismantling judgment. And, and, and why does dismantling judgment get in the way so much? I mean, we're taught to be judgmental. Um, you know, we're taught to have an opinion. If you're working in an organization, you know, leaders want their people to come to them with solutions, come to them with answers. So we're, we're trained to like, oh, I've got to have my opinion. And then, oh, I need to fight for my opinion because I have to be right if I hope to get ahead. There's, that's a, another fallacy people will, will fall into. And then you look at everything, the sort of our societal cues. I mean, we're in a zero sum game society right now where it's winner takes all and, you know, reality TV competitions to politics, to all the things it's all about being judgmental and saying negative things, you know, whether it's trolling somebody or just making some snarky asides, 
it's what we're doing as a society. And and so there's a lot of things that are are training us as individuals to be judgmental. Um, yeah. even, and and s- s- we have to have that awakening and awareness and go, wait a minute, that's not right. I need to stop. Absolutely. And for me, this is yet another thing that I, I found is so powerful with your book is that because you have the five steps, the first of which is to dismantle your judgment, when you are in that moment and you feel it bubbling up, now that you have a framework, you are a little bit more aware of it happening versus before your book, perhaps, you know, maybe if you catch yourself, but you're not quite aware because there was no framework for you to operate within that allows you to realize and recognize that, oh, 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 I'm doing it. I'm doing it. I have to stop yeah. myself. Yeah. And, and, and look, I don't want anybody to think that I'm perfect and they're then that I even think I'm perfect. Judgment still comes up. But, and when I catch myself, I have to decide like, Hmm, am I being judgmental? And it's just my husband and I, and I'm going to make a snarky aside about something we're watching on TV. That's one thing. Um, or is it something related to work? Like at what point do I want to be judgmental? At what points do I want to dismantle it? And it, you know, obviously interacting with other people is when you want to dismantle your judgment first and foremost, and then you can kind of decide in those other po- uh, points in your life, but we all do it and we have to have forgiveness for ourselves and recognize that we do that. Um, so yeah, it, it's something that just is innate and and we have to have that awareness we now train and and walk all of our clients through the five steps um before we go into the field and yeah it it can still come up i i write in the book there's two chapters in the there four chapters in the book on dismantling judgment and my different experiences and the two that i think are kind of polar opposites of each other one is a story um the chapter is called mother would never do that. And I go into somebody's home doing an in-home ethnographic interview and I start being judgmental about this individual and, and it gets the best of me, um, to the point where I start wondering if the guy's a serial killer, if like, what's going on, why are we in this house? Who is this person? I'm not listening to anything that he has to say. And and to this day, I cannot relay what we learned from him. Um, because judgment was getting in my way and it, it's a very entertaining, um, story. So I encourage people to check it out, it but, is. but it's an example of where I let my judgment get the best of me. Um, and, and it put those blinders on or it blocked me. And then there's another chapter around fear. And we were doing a project where we got to go to the NRA gun show. And as a gay white liberal man from San Francisco, the gun show is probably the last place you would expect to find me and where I would expect to find me. And walking into that situation, I could have had a lot of judgment and the same thing would have happened where I was blocking myself. But instead, for whatever reason, I dismantled my judgment. I was aware of it and knew I needed to listen to what people were saying. And I heard things very differently. And it really gave me a great sort of breakthrough and understanding why carry conceal weapons, which is what we were studying, why that was important to people, what was motivating them and what was also motivating people that were more for gun safety or gun control. Um, and, and so again, and some really interesting stories come out of that and experiences, but it was an example where I was able to dismantle my judgment and I was able to get to a, a place of profound empathy, um, that I never would have thought I would have, um, uh, imagined like now it's like, oh, I get it. I understand why people want to carry guns. Now it's super powerful. I mean, the, the force, the forces, uh, that color our reality and form our reality are often unknown even to us, right? The beliefs, the ways in which our upbringing, our environment shape, our thinking and the way we see the world are sometimes. Uh, not even clear to us. So to to really become aware what those forces are and really be able to hold space. Because when I when I listen to this mental judgment, it's really suspending the thoughts and the chatter in your mind that is distracting you from really holding space. 
or the opinion of the other person and, and really pay attention to what they're saying. So yes. we have that first step. What are, what's next? I've successfully dismantled my judgment. I've got myself, I stopped myself. What do I do next? So the next one is asking good questions. Uh, you need to make sure in any conversation that you're having that you're asking open exploratory questions. And I, I explain that a bit more in the book. But the idea is that, uh, again, if you ask a leading question, you're going to get the answer that you want to hear rather than what's true and right for the person that you're talking to. So, you know, they're, they're practical examples in research, but if you're talking to an employee, um, let's say they're late with a report or something, you want to ask them, you know, tell me, tell me about what's going on. You were late, you know, the, the report was late. Help, help me understand what was going on. And then listening to the response and active listening is the third step. But the way that I framed that question was very open. The respondent was whoever I was talking to, their response is going to hopefully be more close to their truth. Um, rather than me at sort of attacking them and saying, why were you late with that report? Um, and why, why is so important it, it's, I mean, we're all trying to understand the greater sort of why in life, but, um, used as a question is really difficult for people. And it puts them on the defensive because from the time that they were, you know, two years old, three years old, what's the question that parents always ask? Well, why did you draw on the wall, cut your sister's hair, do the, you know, all the things, um, that, you know, then you get trained very quickly that punishment is going to follow unless you come up with a really good answer. And that sort of, uh, mindset, as you were saying with the judgment, like that starts to inform how you respond to that question. And it follows you all the way through. Um, it goes, follows you through school and then into your adult life. So, as a leader, if you want to, you know, get the real truth from your team, eliminate the word why, reframe the question using who, what, where, when, and how. And it's challenging. It's hard. And it can actually be a really good team exercise as well. But that's an example of asking a good question because what's going to happen is the person's not going to feel defensive and they're going to just open up, um, you know, so, so they're going to open up and give you a better answer. So there's that. There's asking questions that are more open, meaning they're exploratory rather than saying, um, what do you think of working in the office again? Say, you know, that's leading because I'm kind of, I'm your boss and I'm saying, oh, don't you like coming into the office? Well, instead say, what are your thoughts about and feelings about all the different places that we can work these days? That opens it up and you're going to hear better information because they'll tell you what they think about returning to the office. They'll also tell you what they feel about working from home, the pros and cons. And maybe there's this third place, a coffee shop, a co-working space that they've also found that they also like. And you're going to get a lot more information and have a much richer conversation. And if your goal is to try to get people to come back into the office, you need to understand what's so appealing about the other places other than the office so you can figure out how to um, create something else that might be compelling. So that's asking open questions. So you need to ask good questions. And then the third step is actively listening, and that is being present and paying attention and really listening, not just to the words, but also to the body language, paying attention to the surroundings. Um, one of the things that drives me crazy on zoom calls is when people blur out their backgrounds or they put like the beach or whatever i'd like to see the environment that somebody's in um you know and 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 it helps me understand what is going on with that individual so you know the example and and the example um you know is is when the parent is sitting there and they've got their kid doing cartwheels in the background or you know the cat or the dog is is acting up that's really important information. And as a leader, you should stop and say, Hey, you know, tell me what do you need to take care of? Whatever that is that's, that's going on or who is that what's happening? Um, so that your person is feeling supported, that your employee is feeling supported. And that's one of the great, um, causes of the great resignation was managers weren't, um, 
doing, they weren't taking the time to do that. So they didn't really fully uh, make their employees feel supported during the pandemic and now in the, the years afterward. Um, so you've got to actually pay attention what's happening in that person's life. Like we, we show up as our whole selves to work, whether we want to or not. And if you don't understand that somebody's stressed because something's going on or, you know, they're joyful because something else is happening, all of those things affect how somebody works. Um, and the more that you can understand about who your employees are, your direct reports, the more you're going to be able to support them, the more they're going to give to your organization. Um, you know, and there's studies that find that people in report being more innovative, more loyal, less likely to leave a, a company when they have empathetic leadership. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more with, you know, this idea that with, with COVID and remote work, leaders are handed an incredible opportunity to learn more about their people. Yes, inevitably we bring our whole self to work, but I think when you are in a Zoom call and you you see, you get more data point about the person that you can then use to, to build a little bit more connection and to build a little bit more trust. Maybe they didn't have, they have kids. Maybe you didn't have, know they had pets and, and so on and so forth. So now, you can ask about the pets. You can ask about the kid. You can ask about the the maybe they're taking care of a parent who lives with them. Yeah, all those things are data points that leaders are now given, and they are handed a golden opportunity to build that relationship and build connection. And I see them. I see so many leaders fumbling at that, fumbling at this idea of allowing people to bring their whole self to work because work is supposed to be this place. That is, I don't know. I, I think, yeah, it, I, yes, completely agree. I mean, I, so many people have met my cats. I'm three. Um, Domino tends to be the one that likes to be right here. And I am inevitably on a call and she wants to be right with me. So I'm like, what am I going to do? I've got a screaming cat in the background. Otherwise the thing that'll calm her down is to let her be up here and curl up and, and, you know, pe people are good with that and it, it gives us a chance for them to get to know me. Um, but then yes, it's, it's for the leader though, that's struggling with this. Yeah, it's hard. This is not how we were conditioned and trained. I mean, we're, we're fighting against 80 years of what work it was supposed to look like, which was not emotionally supportive. It was, you know, it wasn't that long ago that the three martini lunch was still a thing. Um, you know, and, and 30 or so years ago got that moved out of fashion for most people. Um, and, and so it is, this is one of those changes, but this change is happening very rapidly and it can be very difficult for people to adjust. And I think as a leader, the questions I would want to ask is, are you, um, um, uh, are you, what are you wrestling with? Um, are you wrestling with the fact that, you know, you've got to try to connect with individuals? Are you wrestling with like the way things used to be? Is there something else going on? Like, you know, you're paying a lot for rent, um, or the, the mortgage on the property that you've bought and the beautiful building that you have. Like what's really got it getting in your way and doing a little bit of that assessment um, and understanding like, oh, I want them to do this. Well, why? What to what end? What are you trying to achieve? What's the outcome? Is there a way? How can you then modify it to fit the current situation and needs of individuals? Yeah, absolutely. So we had step one, dismantle your judgment. Step two, listen actively. Step three, ask better questions. What's step four? So yeah, step four is integrate into your understanding. And this is another one that gets challenging and, and where if you haven't properly dismantled your judgment, it's going to get in your way. So step four, integrate into your understanding is really making room in your head that there are other ways of viewing things, of looking at the world, and it's okay. And you have to make room in your head for, okay, somebody feels this way. You know, the gun story that I talked about is a great example. Like I had to make room in my head that 
for some people, they want to carry a gun and they have that right to do that. And I have to be okay with that. Now, let me get curious to understand what it is about why they want to carry a gun, what motivates that, so that I might be able to then in step five, use solution imagination, have empathy, but to use that to have a conversation or if I wanted to work with them on gun safety um, requirements or whatever the case may be. Um, it's having that understanding and, and connection. Yeah. I mean, for me, the moment I realized that there were other versions of reality that were different than mine, but was still as valid as mine, it was, it was an aha moment. It was a breakthrough because I think we have this false idea that reality as we know it is an objective experience, but really it's a, subje it's a subjective experience that is colored by our own beliefs, our wants, our needs, our fears, our insecurities. And once you understand that there are other versions of reality out there that exist and that are just as valid as yours, I think your life can never be the same. And yeah. yes, completely. And, and, you know, to anybody that's listening to this right now, right in this moment, realize that just in the United States, there's like 335 million people. And right now, right in this moment, there's three of us involved in this conversation, Junior, Rob, and you, the listener. But the other 335 million people are doing something completely different, and that's okay. Yeah. And it's their life and their rules and the things that they need to be doing Maybe they would like to be listening to this. Wouldn't that be nice? But they're not. They're doing something else. And that's okay. They have their own life. They may not even be interested in this podcast. Absolutely. And we have to be we have to be okay with yeah. that. Yeah. Um and, and yeah, you're you're right. It is a very sort of heady realization that the universe doesn't revolve around me. <laughs> that, you know, there are other people, other ways of doing things and being okay with it. And um you know, I, there's a chapter in the book uh, in the Integrate to Understanding section called um, The Language of Home. And I, I open the chapter up by doing an imaginative exercise where you're thinking about just, you know, the your neighbors and what's happening in your neighbor's house and the ways that, they, you know, they may do generally the same things. They have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they sleep, and they love their families but the way that it gets expressed is different and it doesn't make it wrong. It's just what's right for them. And that's what we need to be curious about. And we need to make room in our head that, you know, not everybody celebrates a holiday in the same way. And that's okay. You know, not everybody has the same political belief and that's okay. It can actually make us stronger if we can get curious about it and lean into it. Um, so yeah, so uh, integrate into understanding is the fourth step. Beautiful. The biggest illustration of this idea of reality being a subjective experience is uh, optical illusions. When you when you show two people the same image and they see different things, and despite of how hard you try to see what the other person is seeing, at times you cannot. So it has to force you to ask yourself, how else, in what other ways is this happening in your life? Yeah, um, oh. That's a great example. And even um, if you don't have the Rorschach test in front of you or another optical illusion, the next time you're walking down the street or at the mall or wherever you are with a friend or a family member, pay attention to the things that each one of you notices. And typically what happens, and I write about this in a chapter about perspective taking, where you know, my husband and I will be walking down the street. He tends to look at all the people and he comments on the way somebody is dressed or something that he sees with the, the individuals where I'm looking at the buildings and the signs and the marketing that's out there. And, and that's kind of what I focus on. We're walking the same path, the same stimulus is in front of us, but what we've chosen to focus on is a little different. And we, you know, to your point, we're having the same kind of lived experience, but we're seeing it and coming at it from very different ways. And you know, this is my husband, this is my partner, you, you know, but even the two of us, we see things differently and it's okay. We learn from each other because then he points out things he sees and I point out things that I notice and we have that conversation. Um, and, and so the same thing applies throughout your life at work and, and at home. Yeah. 
And I think this point for me is precisely why this idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion is so powerful at work. I think at times leaders get lost into this check bo uh, box checking exercise and they miss the real power of having that kind of multiple perspective and diversity within a boardroom or within a company is that we might be looking at the same problem, but the lens through which and the vantage point through which we come at it, the, 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 the things that inform the solutions that we propose is completely different. And in that, there is tremendous strength and wealth that will make any company stronger. So really, I always say to leader, if you really think of diversity as an additive thing to your culture, then you will do whatever it takes to make sure that it's represented. But you, if you think about it as this box that you have to check uh, to signal that your, your company perhaps is evolving with the times, then it, it always feels like a, a daunting, not so necessary exercise or thing to do. But really the power is in that variety of perspective and, and the ways people bring different solutions to the same problem, the different lenses through which they look at it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you have to listen to what everybody is saying and, and then together try to make sense of it to reach, okay, this is the judgment, the good judgment, making a judgment. This is the decision. This is what we're going to end up doing. But you need to be respecting and hearing all the voices and, and everybody's experience. And I think you know, there's there's a lot of uh, growing awareness now about our different styles. Again, it's not 1950s um, where it's all white men and they're all type A aggressive. There's a lot of people that show up that are more introverted or that are neurodivergent. And so, how do you um, how do you make space for them or make it comfortable for them to share their opinions and and voices as well and make sure that everybody's being heard? Whether it's a team meeting um, where you're just, you know, a weekly check in, you're trying to move the ball forward um, or it's a larger boardroom sort of setting, you know, it, in all of those situations, you need to be mindful of who's there at the table and, and making sure that you're hearing, not just hearing their voices, but really integrating it um, and so that you can take action on it. All right. So step four was integrating for understanding. Yes. Step five. Use solution imagination. So you've taken all of this information in, and now this is where you start to kind of turn it all on its head and, and turn it back towards the person you're interacting with. So you're starting to imagine what might it be like to be that other person? Um, and how do you continue the conversation? What's the other thing to ask in order to move the ball forward, so to speak, or move the conversation forward? And realizing that empathy sits within so many different skills that we use in the workplace from just general communication to collaboration, persuasion. Um, you know, if you're trying to influence somebody, um, to ideation and problem solving, empathy fuels all of those skills and makes you better at those. So using solution imagination is hearing what's being said and then being able to take it further so that you can further, you know, kind of move the ball forward, so to speak, in the conversation. Um, so, you know, in the the gun uh, story that I was talking about, it was hearing what people were saying and using that understanding to fuel what my next question was going to be. Because I was starting to understand that fear was what was really at the base of that. So I was like, okay, I'm understanding that there's actually some fear there. Let me start to unpack that with them so that I understand even further what was going on. That was an example of using um, solution imagination. In the book itself, um, there's a couple, three different chapters, one of which um, was with, uh, we were doing a study in Canada with immigrants um, and from South Asia and, and China that come into Canada, which is the larger immigrant populations up in Canada compared to the United States. And one of the women um, that we were interviewing she was from India, she's Hindu, and we had been talking earlier about the fact that she was, um, you know, because she was Hindu, she wasn't fully vegetarian, but she definitely wasn't eating beef. And then she told me about how she got a job at Burger King. 
and she was working the line. And I was like, hmm. I'm thinking to myself, okay, wait a minute. The, these two things don't totally make sense. She's, you know, Hindu. And I know that in the Hindu religion, the cow is a sacred symbol, sacred animal. Yet she's having to flame broil the sacred symbol. Like what? You know, and, and so I was using solution imagination, putting myself into her shoes, imagining if I had those values and I was having to stand there and flame broil my deity, what would that feel like? And what was that experience like? And so I asked her and then I'd share the, what she had to say. And it was very moving and powerful, but that's an example of using solution imagination. I was hearing what she was saying. I was connecting the dots. I was integrating it into my understanding and I was turning it around to inform my next question. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to your point, when you really think about this, this is such a powerful thing that although I'm a, I'm an African, a black man in America, living in America, that I can, I can understand the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, the fears, and perhaps even the insecurities of a mother in Afghanistan. Although our experiences, like do not mirror each other and not go. We come from completely different backgrounds. It's, it's quite, when you really pause to think about it, it's quite an astonishing, incredible superpower that we have that we, we take for granted and therefore do not use to its full capability. Yeah, it is. And, and, and yet when you get it right, when you do it and you get it right, um, you know, if you're in marketing, like if you look at the most successful marketing products, campaigns, empathy is at its core and understanding who the consumer is. Whenever they say, oh, that really connected with the audience, the connection they're talking about is empathy. There's an empathetic connection that I understand you, therefore it resonated with you, therefore you know you bought this product or, or service. Um, and as a leader, you know, the leaders that people look up to individually, and I'm not talking about the celebrity leaders that are on Twitter or own Twitter or whatever, <laughs> but the actual leaders that if you ask anybody who's a business leader that you look up to or admire, they're probably going to tell you somebody that they personally know and have worked with, and they will probably, and you ask them, tell me more, tell me more. What is it about that person um, that, that put them on that list for you? They will share that they listened to me, they supported me, I felt safe, uh, they took you know care of me, they looked after me, they had a vested interest in me. All of those things are about empathy. Um, and they're, they're using the tools that show empathy, and that's the connection that's being made. It isn't, oh, he made billions of dollars, therefore I want to be just like him. Right. Um, it's, oh no, this, this person is somebody that looked up to me, that's or you know, that I look up to because they had empathy with me. So um, it, it's actually a great question for people to ask their teams. Like, you know, if they, if you want to understand what people get motivated by, throw that question out. Yeah. And, the, and so the question is to be clear, who's, who are some business leaders that you look up to it can be anybody. And then what is it about those business leaders that got them on that list and look for the patterns in the answers that people have. And that'll tell you a lot about them and what they're looking for. And it'll give you as a leader, some good fodder for how to model yourself. Who come to mind for you when you think about that question? And it doesn't necessarily even have to be a business leader, just, just a leader, somebody who has had an impact in your life. It can be a business leader or we can have or just a general. Like I mean, the people that have had the most influence on my life are the people that have been involved in my life. Um, and that, you know, so early bosses come to mind as people that helped me understand, um, they helped me understand how to move through the world, but they made it safe for me to find my own way to move through the world and to be myself um, and not have to kind of conform um, to some sort of, you know, structure. Um, so th there's several bosses early on in my career that I would say my dad, tremendous influence. He was in sales. Um, you know, and he, he taught me a lot. My mom as well. Very, you know, I, I call my mom a silent badass. 
um, she did, she's done so much, um, volunteer work and other activities, um, you know, and, and success in her own career, but she's very, very humble about it. Um, you wouldn't necessarily know looking at her that, oh, she went and lobbied Congress about breast cancer research and breast cancer advocacy and helped support groups and, and, you know, other nonprofit activities from the time that I, as long as I can remember. So those are all individuals that have had a big influence on me. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I look to, um, you know, Oprah Winfrey, Nelson Mandela, Barack Obama, I think have all been influential. Joe Biden even, um, has been, a, he, he is an empathy. You know, if you want to know an empathetic leader that's actually out in the world, I would say Joe Biden is probably the biggest, uh, current example of that. Whether you agree with his politics or not, he uses empathetic language. He reflects empathy. Um, you know, I, I, I do know some people in the White House and everything that I hear is that they, he is, you know, that, that is what you, you see. He does genuinely care and reflect that. Um, so yeah, that, that I would say are the immediate ones that are coming to my mind. Yeah. Beautiful. So what, what is an empathy, uh, activist, an empathy activist and, and how did that come about? Like what? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I loved the tension between the two words, um, empathy and then activist. And because as we were saying earlier, empathy is very soft and activist is like, oh, people think, oh, they're marching on the street and protesting and, and all of that. Well, when you look at the real definition of the word activist, they're somebody that's campaigning for a change. And there's a lot of different ways to campaign for change. You can march on the streets and, and that's really necessary and needed. But you can also do it from, you know, your, the safety of your desk or whatever way that makes sense for you. It's, though, about speaking up and campaigning for change. So an empathy activist is anyone, and I invite other people to, to join me and us, an empathy activist is somebody who is campaigning to really just make the world a better place, one conversation at a time and helping be empathetic and help other people be empathetic um, and in all of their engagements. And that's going to lead to better communication and collaboration. We're going to solve the problems that are facing the world. Um, so, so that's where empathy activists came from. And I have to say, I did not coin that phrase. I wish I could, could take credit for it, but I found somebody on LinkedIn like eight years ago that had that as in their little description on LinkedIn. And I was like, oh my God, that's so amazing because I saw the tension in the, the words. And I just asked them, I said, do you mind if I use that? And, and it was a woman, I just can't remember who. And she was very gracious and said, yes, um, yeah, absolutely. And so I started to use it. And so very similarly, because she was open, I, I let other people um, and ask other people to, to use that. We're, we're, we can all be empathy activists. Well, beautiful. I, I think uh, I'm, I might borrow that myself because I very much, in the way you put it, consider myself somebody who hopes to really bring about some change, uh, leveraging the power of empathy. I think it's it's an incredibly powerful idea for, for marketers to connect with customers, an incredibly powerful idea for leaders um, to connect with the employees. And I think, you know, whether or not you call it that, it, even if you all you want is for people to buy more, even if all you want is for employees to be more productive, I believe that the way the way to get there, the way to do that is to find out what drives these people, what needs they have, what fears they have, and to help them make progress and to help them overcome those things. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It is all, I mean, empathy is, sits at the center of so much that we do. Um, and without empathy, we're lost. We are. Those are beautifully, beautiful closing words. So how how and where can we can we find you and and hear a little bit more about these ideas that that you put forth so beautiful in your book uh, that I highly 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 recommend for anyone who wants to move past the theory of empathy and why it matters and really want to get 
practical and get some actionable steps that they can take to really become more empathetic, this is the book for you. Yeah, thank you. So uh, tell me more about that, Solving the Empathy Crisis, One Conversation at a Time. Uh, the book is available in hardcover, in ebook, and also I narrated the audio book. So wherever you buy books and in whatever form the book is available. So whether that's your independent bookseller, Amazon, um, you know, Barnes and Noble or another uh, book source, Apple books, uh, it is available there. So please check that out. You can also, I uh, would love to continue the conversation if people want to find me on LinkedIn, Rob Volpe, V O L P E. Um, you can also find me. I'm pretty active on Instagram as empathy activist. Um, and if you have Peloton, I'm also up at the activist on Peloton, okay, okay. give me a high five there, uh, and any of the other socials as well. Um, and then my website, uh, for my company, if you're interested in learning more about consumer insights, the company name is ignite 360 and the website is ignite, I G N I T E dash 360.com. And then the website related to the book and speaking engagements and, and workshops and things is the number five, five steps to empathy.com. So number five steps to empathy.com. So I hope people connect. I would love to continue the conversation and yeah. thanks junior for an amazing chat today. No, oh, thank you. Thank you for making the time. We will make sure to add uh, all the relevant information for how people can find you and how they can have access to the book on, on the show notes. And I wanted to close by really, really thanking you for the work that you do both in the marketing sphere of really helping brands connect with customers, connect with people at a human level and allowing them to really flex and deploy the empathy muscle for those people. And then for the work that you do, just really bring a little bit more awareness and giving us again the steps in how to be more empathetic in our respective life, whether it's personally or professionally. Thank you so, so much. Uh, our world definitely needs more empathy activist. It, we do. And thank you, Junior, for the work you guys are doing and helping spread the word. And, you know, it takes all of us to do this. So um, let's let's go. We all have a, a role to play. All right. I have my marching orders, so I will, I will take them and I will run. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Everyone else does, too. Let's listen. Right. Well, thank you very much. It was an amazing conversation. Thank you, Junior. Really appreciate it.